Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining me for episode one of the STL Tones podcast. My name is Ray and I have with me in the studio the almighty Andy James. Andy James, how you doing? Yeah, I'm good. How's it going? Yeah. Hi. Doing all right. Thank you so much for taking the time. And, uh, you know, STL, the man himself, wanted to get this podcast going. And uh, he said, who do you want to have on? And I said right off the bat, 100%, I want Andy James. Um, so, you know, I just, I, I'm looking forward to this interview and, you know, just hanging out and talking. So um, I'm really oh, looking cool. forward to it. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what's, what's going to happen. I, I literally just exploded a curry in the uh, kitchen for my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> very cool, very cool. Well, so it, it smells a bit weird in here. Oh, hey, luckily I can't smell it from where I'm at, so. No, no, armpit. <laughs> Just imagine that. Okay, all right, very cool. So it, it probably is your armpit and you're blaming it subconsciously <laughs> on, to, to everybody listening. Oh, hey, I, oh yeah, yeah, I spilled some curry. It's it's not me, I swear. <laughs> no, it's about 7 o'clock here, so I have actually had a shower today. It's all right. Well, hey, I'm proud of you, man. At least, at least one of us has. <laughs> <laughs> So what just, time is it there then? It is. Uh, I'm on Eastern Standard Time, so I'm in Philadelphia right now. So it is just shy of 2 p.m. here. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah. So All I got right. I got midday. So I just got a couple hours behind. But you know, hopefully I won't keep you too long for your Friday evening. Thanks for taking the time, no, man. Right. Cool. So, so I think I would would love to just start, you know, just with the basic introduction of how you became influence not necessarily with guitar right away but with just music in general i mean i would i would love to hear you know your your first and biggest influence on how like you know what's your earliest memory of of just music in general it could be anything uh my earliest memory of uh, i mean it was a long long time ago now <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's probably uh in school it's probably about eight or nine or something like that i think it was probably around the time that Guns N' Roses were doing promo for Appetite for Destruction because I remember the, the stuff was getting played on the radio. Right. Because so um, I think Paradise City was the first thing they put out. Um, I can't remember now. But yeah. interestingly enough, I was reading the other day that the album didn't do very well for at least the first six or seven months it came out. Yeah, and it, then, it, it, uh, tanked, it, it tanked it in the beginning. Yeah, and then, and then obviously Sweet Child of Mine came out and that was it, you know what I mean? They've kind of just become one of the biggest bands ever. But yeah, it's kind of nuts really that that's how it happened even for them, you know what I mean? But I think around the time I um, I didn't really know who they were or, or anything like that, but there was a bunch of kids at school that were like, you know, into it and stuff. In, so I managed into, to get into, hold of her. Into guns? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So I, uh, I managed to get... Um, <laughs> there was this kid actually I remember uh, he used to do a really good electric guitar impression with his voice <laughs> <laughs> and he was just singing the the riff of Paradise City and I, I was kind of like obsessed with trying to do it myself and I just couldn't really do it so I thought oh, you know fuck it I'll uh, pick up a real guitar instead <laughs> mind you that didn't come until much later but I did manage to get a tape of the album and I, I played that quite a lot and um, I think one of my favourite songs on there was Night Train Oh, absolutely. Um, especially like the end, the end guitar solo. I was really like into what it, what Slash was doing over like the vocal at the end and stuff. I don't know. It was just a bunch of like really cool moments on that album that just made me want to get get behind it all. I actually built my first guitar out of like a, a it's almost like a plastic Lego type thing with elastic band. <laughs> So I was already into guitar before I'd even pick one up, you know what I mean? Right, absolutely. So it's, it just seems like it's just like a catalyst and a chain of events of you just being at the the right age or, you know, the age of, you know, eight or nine, whatever. And that's when you're pretty pretty open to all the stuff, you know, around you and you can be easily influenced. And, and just, just by chance, you grew up in late 80s at, around that time. And then, you know, yeah. Guns N' Roses exploded right, right at the end of the hair metal days. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I wasn't really, I didn't really have a musical taste at that point. Like, I didn't really, you know, have like a listening, you know, I wasn't sitting down listening to music really um, at that age. I had a Walkman, but it was probably more for like, you know, kids' spoken word stories or something. It wasn't really like for listening to metal or right. rock, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't until like 12, really. I was at, um, I was at like a boarding school. So I wasn't home like all the time, uh, but they had like music rooms and stuff there, and they had like some beaten up old like acoustic guitars in there and stuff. Right, and I heard and, I heard elsewhere uh, you had a you had a piano in there as well too, right? Yeah, yeah, there was a piano in. There. I mean, I started kind of doing piano stuff like early on, um, 
but I didn't really, do you know, it, it was kind of weird because there wasn't really, I wasn't aware of players that could like shred or do anything cool on, on a piano. It was all like, you know, grades and classical music. And I suppose, you know, whereas I, I have an appreciation for that kind of thing now at the time I, I didn't have an ear ready for that kind of thing. And I just didn't consider it very cool. If I'd have seen someone like, I don't know, Derek Sherinian or something like that, I probably would have stuck with it, you know, hearing a keyboard played like a guitar and then be like, Oh, okay. Right. I can, I can sort of do something, but yeah, I, ne- I never stuck with it. But, um, so I was having piano lessons and stuff, but I was kind of just not doing that and going into the practice rooms and playing a completely different instrument. So my parents were basically wasting money on something I wasn't really <laughs> interested in, but I didn't have the heart to tell them. So it wasn't until much later, but yeah. So anyway, um, so I, I'd been doing that for a bit, but I, I didn't really like, cause it was like nylon gut acoustic guitars and they were pretty difficult to play. I could kind of get my head around it, but um, it wasn't until like my 12th birthday and I was sort of said to my dad, oh, you know, it was like one weekend where they could like come up, visit, take you out for the day or whatever. And we went up Brighton and um, it was just like old guitar shop and ended up buying this old like Fender copy thing. It wasn't, it wasn't a Fender, it was something else, but it looked like the black and white right. know, classic Fender. Like, and like just a, like like a amp- first act Squire, you know, whatever, starter kind. Pack. Yeah, it wasn't even a Squire. It was like under that. You know, oh, wow. Was, yeah. Yeah, so it was, but it was cheap. It was like, well, you know, I don't really know if he's going to like stick with this. So we'll just get it, see what happens. And then to be honest with you, that was kind of it, really. I was, I was off and running. I just, I never put the thing down. Um, Because funnily enough, even though my dad bought me my first guitar, it was him that was kind of paying for the piano lessons. And he was a little bit strung out when I finally revealed that I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, But I think in the end, he was, he was, it was like, look, you know, if this is what you really want to do, then then do it you know yeah absolutely it's just it's kind of like kind of like the the thing like with kids that like you know if their parents want them to be the next great you know barry bonds baseball player you know or something like that but like if they if they don't have the heart you know it's kind of the kid at the end of the day has to choose you know hey i don't like baseball i like you know this or that and you know it kind of kind of sucks at first but like you know you certainly found your passion along the way you know what i mean yeah i mean i, I suppose initially like I mean, my mum was always like, she wanted me to be academic. The thought of me like doing music for a living just scared scared the shit out of her. Because, you know, like most people do when you tell them you do music for a living, they think you're on some sort of government dole queue or something, you know, getting your, drawing your money every week. Like, yeah, you're, absolutely. you're not like, making money from your, your actual living or whatever. Right. And they always, they always, they always not, like look down on it too. You know what I mean? Like, they, just don't, they don't know all yeah. the different ways you can you can sustain it. Sure. It's a little bit extra work as people in the industry know, but there is ways to do it. But people that don't know about those ways, they automatically, it's either you're in Metallica or you're like on the streets. You know what I mean? It's like, there's, there's such a middle ground that people don't even know about. No, no. I mean, the other thing that's weird as well is like, I mean, obviously the music industry was a lot different back then. So there was, I mean, arguably it was probably more of an opportunity to make money from doing actual music rather than having to diversify, which is kind of how you have to uh, survive now within the industry. I mean, it's still wholly possible. I mean, there's still money in the industry. Anyone that says, oh, yeah, there's no money anymore, it's rubbish. I mean, you just got to do something else, but it's still music-based, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, like, you know, so like my mum, for example, she wouldn't. She, she's not really into, like, you know, the rock and, and, and bands and stuff like that. She's, so like her her idea of doing that kind of thing would have just been like, well, yeah, but you know, I, I suppose it's the thing. It's like, well, you know, what made, I think the thing that scared her was like, well, why, what, what is it about you that's going to set you apart from all the thousands of other people that are trying to do the same thing? And you're probably not going to, you know, maybe just concentrate on your education sort of thing. And I think it's not because they don't believe in you. I think they're just, Obviously, they want the best for you, yeah, and I feel like if you have something that's a little bit more considered normal, um, then you've probably got a, a much smaller margin for error actually succeeding at life. You know what I mean? Right. It's almost like a uh, like a you know following. It's like the the quintessential cliche of doing what you love versus doing what you have. You know, doing what you have to do to get by. It's like if you follow your dreams, there's a big big risk but there's also a great reward at the end and you know if you take the safer route it's kind of it's 
it's not maybe not exactly what you want to do, but there is more more opportunities to succeed. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I did try like normal life. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't until much later I actually started making waves and sort of like doing it as a career because it was pretty late for me, really, like late twenties before anything really started happening where I could just do music and, and nothing else. Right. But um, so yeah, you know, I suppose I did have that in mind where I'd still need to like have like a job and because I've had I've done jobs, you know, everything from like McDonald's to Starbucks to selling insurance to cutting lettuces in a factory like during the summer i mean (laughs) just anything to sort of like have a bit of money really but i guess the one thing i've always had is like an independent attitude like i've never you know really needed a huge amount of help of anyone else if i want to go and do something or get some money for something or or whatever i wasn't really looking to like my mum or dad to like oh just you know give me this money and i can go and go and do that or whatever so i I, even though You know, the thought of doing music, it was difficult because I didn't really know how to, like, get into the industry. I didn't know anybody that was, like, um, in the industry or anything like that. Um, So it wasn't until I got to college and I I got in a band and then we started doing cover gigs. And, you know, I did that for quite a few years. Um, And didn't really, again, didn't really think about sort of teaching or, or getting out there and doing my own stuff or anything like that. I think the initial drive for me at playing guitar was was a couple of things really it was like uh some sort of social acceptance because like i wasn't really good at anything else so this kind of gave me something that i was good at that maybe other people i was knocking around with right weren't weren't so i suppose they'd be like oh right yeah that's cool you can do that you know rather than get bullied and just be you know considered a complete loser i suppose (laughs) yeah just it just made you it just made you stand out just from your peers because you know it just it sounds like you had a gift early on or you know you certainly gravitated towards it and then just by sticking with it and then doing doing something that not any not very many other people around you if anybody you know that that they can't do so it's like that's like your thing that's i heard you say before this is your credibility like i can I can shred, I, or I can play this. I can play this Guns N' Roses tune. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Oh yeah, you play out. the intro to "Sweet Child of Mine." You know, everyone's sitting around with the jaws open. Yeah. Because it's like for most people that don't have any working idea of of how you would even go about doing that, it's just amazing to them. Like, I mean, it's different. You know, if you play guitar and you watch another guitar player, especially now. I mean, even with like some of the crazy things that's going going on, especially you know, way past like my own ability, even even like now. I still get what's going on. It, I'm, I mean, I'm blown away by the technical aspect of it, but I'm sort of like, okay, yeah, I can see what's going on there. It, 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 that, there's no mystery there, you know what I mean? Right, yeah, you can still, Whereas, you can, you can still wrap your head around it, even though it is yeah. incredible nonetheless. Yeah, I'm not saying that I could, I could do it. Or, you know, I'm going to have a go and stuff, but normally with me, I see stuff that I like that other people are doing, and I just change it to how I would do it, but use the concept and still, you still end up with like an end goal that represents the same kind of idea, but it's not playing something exactly the same. I suppose that's kind of how I've always approached guitar. Like, I mean, I learned slash solos, ones that I could play note for note, and then other ones I just used to learn half of it and then be like, oh, well, I can play this, and it kind of has the same buzz as that on the end. You know, so I was never really that obsessed with learning anything note for note. So when I got the job, so... <clears throat> Okay, moving into like, because, uh, yeah, moving into actually working as a guitar player, I um, did a guitar competition, ended up going through all of that and, and winning it, and Ernie Ball sponsored it. Uh-huh. And uh, from that, I met a guy called Jamie Humphreys, he, who was, um, or still is, a, a sort of teacher, session player and stuff like that. He tours all over the world and that. But he was working for Lit Library at the time. And I guess he kind of thought that I would slot in quite well there, you know, because they were doing everything other than the sort of like really heavy shredder stuff. They weren't, no one was really covering it for right. them. They they almost recruited you to to be the guy to do that because nobody else nobody else had the, that job at that time. Yeah, so they could do more stuff like you know Megadeth, at Pantera, and all, all that sort of stuff. I mean, a, a couple of them had already done things like Vi and a bit of Metallica here and there, you know. So it wasn't like they didn't have anyone that couldn't do it. It was just right, maybe... Nah, yeah, not, not saying like nobody physically di- wasn't technical or skilled enough, just that they just needed a, like a, a newer, young young face to come in and, and appeal to, the, to a newer generation of people want to learn songs and stuff. I guess so, yeah. And, and like the other thing as well, I suppose they... 
not around that time. I mean, YouTube had been around for a bit, but it wasn't anywhere near like what it is now. Right. So it was far less saturated in terms of like, you know, people being on it and, um, you know, doing like covers of this, that and the other and and, and that. So a lot of my stuff that I'd done for Lick Library, which was actual DVD stuff, had had kind of made its way onto YouTube as well. Right. And for some reason, it just started to get quite a lot of traction. You know, a lot of people were watching the videos and and kind of getting getting into it from from there. Right. Um, If I I could if I could interject on my own personal experience, I I bought I don't I don't want to say the like I'm paraphrasing the title in case it's wrong, but it was something about metal arpeggios, and it was it was a DVD. Extreme metal arpeggios. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, and it had like a crazy like it looked like a BC Rich Warlock with like a broken broken mirror guitar. It was like, a mirror, yeah. yeah, yeah. It wasn't my guitar; it was just for the cover. Like. Right, and I was just like, oh man, I want to check this out. And you know, I saw you. I did, you know, this, this a couple of years ago. No offense to anybody, but I didn't know who you were until. Um, until I started to dive into, you know, the industry and the guitar yeah. and, you know what I mean? And I was like, Oh my God, that's the guy. And then, you know, here we are today. It's just like, it's kind of cool how it's, it's coming all full circle that like, you're talking about the story of how you got your big break through this competition and through liquor library. And now it's like, that was your almost, it seems like that was your catalyst to where you are today. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, when I got the call, I was literally I didn't have a you know pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. You know what I mean? So like, right. I was kind of like, I had a job and I quit. And I was teaching local kids at the time, but I wasn't making any money. A girlfriend at the time, she was cool enough to just let me do that and be like, look, you know, give it, I don't know, what six months or whatever. And if it kind of doesn't pick up or or, or anything, then maybe just consider getting another job because I don't want to be paying the mortgage for forever. So I was right. like, okay. And she still had a full time job, you know. Yeah. Did you, so, did, did you, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just going to ask, did you feel, did you feel, um, a sense of extreme amount of pressure before this, before this competition? And then did you feel a, a giant sense of relief after the fact? I don't know. Like, I suppose I always had this like underlying thing. Um, cause you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, it was like social acceptance and just kind of being good at something and almost like an escapism for me playing guitar as well. Like music was really good. I don't know, therapy for me when I was like younger with a couple of things that I was, you know, going through. Um, Most notably my parents splitting up and all that kind of stuff. And I used to just bury a lot of that and, you know, just have, just play my guitar and and, and that'd be it. So it wasn't really my dream to like, you know, tour the world, be a rock star or whatever and, um, and, and do all of that or do it for a career even. It was just like, you know, what I said before. So when I got this job, it was like, okay, this is like the first opportunity that's come along where it looks like I could get some sort of foot in to the industry. It wasn't, you know, playing in a band, original songs and touring, but it was a way of doing something that would get the name out there um, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Because going behind the scenes of that, it's funny, there was a post on uh, on Facebook the other day where someone mentioned the, um, the John Petrucci forum. Oh, yeah, yeah that's old school and that stuff. Was, yeah, that was kind of going on at the same point. And a friend of mine, a uh, guy called Martin Goulding, he um, he was like a teacher at uh, GIT. I think he still is. Um, you know, he's quite a well-respected teacher in the London area and stuff. He uh, he said to me, I said, oh, you know, maybe you should consider going on the JP forum because that's kind of where a lot of people were hanging out. Um, and he was like friends with Charlie Griffiths at the time. He was a uh, Haken guitar player now. But, right. Um, you know, we kind of, sometimes used to sort of hang out uh, a bunch of us and just kind of shred in, in Martin's house or whatever. And it's kind of funny how how all of us have, have gone off to do different things. But yeah, there's quite a few players that are, are really prominent now within the industry that came out of that forum. And it's just funny how that time of like YouTube breaking and more and more guitar players coming out and obviously, you know, the players within that forum and stuff as well. And then my own thing with Lick Library and spreading and I don't know, it just kind of feels like it all came from this like nucleus of a community that just sort of like grew out and some of us just went off to go and do different things, I suppose. Um, so it's a pretty cool time for like getting your name out there. I think that's kind of my point. Yeah, because I, I don't think I'd want to be doing it now. It's it's much it's like infinitely more saturated as you know. It's like it's yeah. how do, how do you it's almost like now it seems like you have to do something that's not even necessarily musically inclined but something that has like I don't I don't want to 
I've used my words carefully, but you know what I mean. Like it's like just just technicality and musicianship isn't enough to get anywhere anymore. You know what I mean? There has to be like a, no. a, something else. I mean, yeah. I just I always uh, I always think you know people have like the balls to kind of do these like almost like funny skit type videos. Right, that, right, right, right. Some of it's music, but most of it is like, and I, I don't know. Like, I mean. It's kind of weird because, like in real life, I you know joke around and fuck about all the time, but I just don't know how I would translate that into something believable on camera that people would relate to. I always just feel like, well, I just play guitar and write songs, so I'm just going to sit there and do that. If people like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. You know. So I'm not a hugely animated type of person when I'm doing that kind of thing. Right. So. Um, but it's kind of weird, you know, because I, I meet people, say, at NAMM or shows or whatever, and quite often they'll sort of say, oh, yeah, I'm, I never thought you'd actually, you know, sort of be halfway, like, happy or kind of just joke around or fuck about or whatever, because I suppose I look <laughs> so serious when I'm doing this stuff. But it's like, well, that's just what I do, you know. I, I play guitar. That's yeah, it's it. like, oh, that's wow, real... wow, you have a personality. What a, what a, what a comment. Yeah, but, you know, I, I think, like, a lot of these people, when they put their personality into these videos and stuff, I guess that kind of what sets it apart and, I you guess, know, maybe, yeah. maybe maybe expands it further than maybe just the content on its own would take it, um, which is kind of why I'm saying, like, now, I don't know if, if what I would be doing now would necessarily get any traction, whereas I suppose, like, before doing the whole lip library thing and stuff, because that was fairly professional in the way it was filmed and... and um, recorded and, and stuff like that. I mean, I say professional, like the other way isn't professional, but I just mean that, you know, there wasn't any larking about or anything. It was like, you know, this is a serious... Yeah, it was a job. It was a business. Yeah, yeah. yeah so no, there, wasn't I, I totally any, there wasn't any of that. Yeah, so it was hard to... It was hard to interject any personality into it from the beginning, and I guess I've kind of just stayed the same, you know, right. throughout the whole, I mean, just, whole thing. You just stayed true to who you are, and you didn't try to have any sort of gimmick or any sort of side act to to gain attention that's kind of like you know what you're saying with the whole comedy thing there's nothing i don't personally have anything wrong with it but it's like you know and in a way it makes sense it's like from a business platform you know you got to you got to do something to stand out nowadays i mean there's millions of, of people have, yeah. so it's yeah. like if if you got a if you got a sense of humor you know and you can play i mean you can't you can't uh you know say anything bad about somebody that that does that you know what i mean no, I'd you know I'd say someone like Jared Dines is like a perfect example of someone that can do both. Yeah, I mean he's a killer you know, player, you know. Exactly, and you know he's got a great personality on camera as well. You know what I mean? So it stands to reason that someone like him has, has spread far and wide. You know, with with doing what he's doing because it's entertainment at the end of the day. It isn't just the one thing. Right, he's so, got. He, that's he covers. I mean, he can play. He can. He's funny, and he's just a. I've never personally met him, but I mean, he's a. You know, on camera, he seems like a general wholesome dude that like you could hang out with and have a normal conversation, and that appeals to people. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. But again, you know, that's kind of. I think it's also about having a self awareness as well. Like he's obviously got a really great self awareness about how he comes across, and obviously how he projects his idea. Because I suppose there's probably other people that do that kind of thing that maybe don't yeah. <laughs> have that self-awareness that do it anyway. And you're just like, this is weird. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of, kind of getting awkward. Like, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm, you know, my own self-awareness just sort of like tells me, yeah, I'm comfortable with that or, cause at the end of the day, like, I mean, especially now I have to edit a lot of my own videos. So I'm, if I'm sitting there wincing at like what I'm doing, I yeah. don't know if I'd be able to get through an edit and then I'd just never put any videos out, you know what I mean? Right, so. absolutely. Um, going back a little bit, I want to go back in time. I have a question about, you know, you're talking about Slash and, you know, guns and you getting heavily influenced during, you know, late 80s, early 90s. And then the, all the, the, the whole 90s, I mean, let's be real, it wasn't, it was not shred oriented with like the exception of like Satriani, Steve Vai and, and Petrucci. Like those are like the big three off the top of my head. I'm sure there's obviously more, but... I think you know what I'm saying. Like the big bands were like, you know, their Nirvanas, the Soundgardens, and then even later on, like Corn, and then you know, Limp Bizkit, Deftones. There was no, there was no shredding. How, did, how or why did you? Was it on purpose to be extremely technical and and proficient in the instrument, or is it just that's who you are as a person? Like I would love to hear why, as you got older and you can you continue to, to get better, you know, physically and not just follow the trends in the sign right. of the times 
Um, yeah, I mean, if I think back, I mean, I wasn't really into metal, so I didn't grow up with Pantera, Megadeth, Metallica. I mean, I was aware of Megadeth mm-hmm. and like Friedman stuff. And if I'm honest, I wasn't a huge fan of, of that because it was like super scooped and really just kind of like the vocals and stuff. I wasn't, I mean, not just Megadeth, I just mean metal in general. It wasn't something that really resonated with me. So like, I liked bands like, you know, Guns N' Roses and Extreme, and uh, I'd kind of just discovered Mr. Big before I'd got to college. Um, so I'm going to get on to the next thing in a minute. But mm-hmm. yeah, like from a technical guitar player point of view, that was pretty much that. And then there was Joe Satriani, which I had like a, uh, I had to like surf with the alien. And then I got into some of his other albums and stuff. Um, like one of my favorites was Crystal Planet. and But that kind of came out while I was at college. Right, okay. Uh, but yeah, there was like the extremist, uh, Flying in the Blue Dream. And, and so yeah, so I, I knew about the instrumental in, uh, guitar thing, but his stuff was the only only thing I really knew about, uh, possibly Vi as well. But I, I remember someone had actually suggested to me Passion and Warfare. And again, you know, much like with the classical music when I was younger, I, I listened to it and I, I didn't really know what I was listening to. You know, I was like... yeah yeah this this isn't like going in you know i don't i don't really understand what's going on with satriani because it was a little bit more um to the point like musically i suppose yeah i, um, I get I what could, you're saying well it, it it resonated with the background that i had with these other bands that i was listening to so like when i listened to boy i'd never heard you know copious amounts of effects and strings and all this other stuff going on right um so i didn't really know how to process all of that so so yeah, that's kind of how I got through. So like the first half of the nineties was was listening to that. Um, at this point, I knew who Paul Gilbert was. I didn't know about Racer X. This, this came so I I learned about his career. Asked about Face, um, but it wasn't until ninety six was the year. Um, it was the year I started college. I was sixteen, and uh, there was a guy in the year above the course that I started. So it was like a um, recording techniques performance course. It was like a two year thing diploma. Um, so I was on that and, uh, he was just like, he just had all this music that he was just like listening to, like sitting around college and I'd hear it and I'd be like, fucking hell, what's that? Or so, I mean, <laughs> I'd gone from listening to, you know, slash Satriani and Nudo Betancourt to learning about shrapnel records, dream theater. Uh, and it just blew my mind with, a, with all this stuff that I had no idea existed. Right. Um, so yeah, it was like learning about, uh, you know, like Zach world. Cause that came later as well. I didn't really know. Although I, I, like I'd only been playing a couple of years or whatever. And I was in a music shop down Denmark street in London one day. And the store owner said that my style sounded like, Zach Wilde but at this point I'd never even I didn't even know who that was right you know what I mean so the name I already had heard of the name but I was like okay um I'd never really listened to any Aussie stuff so then I, I discovered like no rest for the wicked no more tears um uh well actually yeah I think no more tears had come out by then yeah no more oh, tears. no that's right that was like 92 actually, actually I think or something like that yeah 91. yeah I th- I think it was live and loud. Ah, okay, okay. This, this guy was listening to live and loud, and there was a guitar solo on it. I was just like, Jesus Christ, this is this is just amazing. So yeah, Malmsteen, Paul Gilbert's earlier stuff. Um, uh, yeah, Dream Theater. So I, I I've heard images and words. Like Pull Me Under was the first song. I guess that's kind of the same for a lot of people because yeah, it was the most popular song. That's at the time. everybody's first time hearing Dream Theater. Is Pull Me Under. Yeah, um, and. I don't know. I was kind of like obsessed with that record for a while. Again, I didn't learn all of it. I just learned the bits that kind of stood out to me as being cool, which is kind of what I've done with all this stuff. Really, I never sat down and learned whole songs or albums. I just, I was like, oh yeah, that's cool. I want to learn that, so I just sit down and learn that section or whatever. Um, and then yeah, I'd, I'd started to learn about shrapnel, and then I got into guys like Greg Howe, Tony McAlpine, Vinnie Moore. Um, yeah, I mean, you name it. I. I just kind of spent the next 10 years or whatever just dissecting and, and digesting all of that stuff right yeah so it's just um, it just sounds like just the 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 fads of the mid to late 90s this wasn't wasn't appealing at the end of the day no i just didn't really get it like you know bands like chord and that's like they're just playing one note and they i was just i didn't really get it like it was seven strings 
it was just it was a whole nother thing that because I was I was so obsessed with music to the point where it had to have a guitar solo in it and I didn't even care if the song was any good it had to have a guitar solo in it and I never thought that I would actually branch out of that way of thinking <laughs> you, I, like you would boycott you would boycott bands or songs that like didn't have any sort of solo yeah I'd be oh, like wow. this is shit I'm not <laughs> listening to that <laughs> Yeah, it's t- it's stupid, really. But I guess when you're obsessed with something, you just got blinkers on, you know. You yeah, I mean, really... yes and no. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't really see the bigger picture. So I wasn't even, I didn't really care about songwriting, really. So I, it wasn't until like I felt like I'd maybe exhausted all of that kind of stuff, and then I thought, right, okay, well, you know, maybe I'm going to start writing some music. I suppose like because I've been through, you know, some bands or whatever. Because um, I, I feel like I've always been on my own with the instrumental thing. But I didn't really know how I was going to present it like to the world because I'd start listening to this and start listening to something else and I'd be like starting to write my songs like that and nothing would ever like buzz me, you know what I mean? I was just yeah. like, kind of so, never, never, never had like a finished like product or like your own sound. Like it would always just kind of like be steered by this or that influence and never be like a, almost like a finished product. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, I think so. And like, obviously you listen to all this instrumental stuff and there was a lot of great guitar players that didn't have very good songs. So, yeah. I, you know, because my focus wasn't on that, I didn't really realize. So when it started coming to like writing my own stuff, I was just like, oh God, you know, I've got all this technique and ideas and stuff that I could do, but I've got no backdrop in which it works in which it works over so i I started having to sort of like get into more bands that maybe um weren't so much focused on the sort of shredding aspect i suppose and most notably for me my introduction to like metal which i could actually stomach was kill switch engage so i remember i remember seeing uh i was around my mate's house and he had uh kerrang on or scuzz i think something like that anyway yeah, and the song TV came on yeah yeah and i was just like fucking hell and it was it turns out it was end of heartache it took me a while to find out because once i'd seen this song i was so drawn in by the song i, I just remembered who the band was but i couldn't remember the album or the, even the name of the song so then when i had to like find it i didn't know what I was looking for in the record store this is when you could still go into a record store and buy a cd yeah or good old days yeah, and um, I was sort of looking through, and I, I ended up buying the wrong album. And it, I was like, this doesn't even sound like the singer that I heard. It <laughs> turns out I bought Alive with Just Breathing. And anyway, I was yeah. like, okay, well, this is still cool. Because <laughs> like, stuff like, you know, My Last Serenade and Fixation on Darkness, I was like, yeah. this, is, this is it for me. This is like, I can get behind this because it's actually, it's well played like rhythm guitar. It sounded good as well. Like it was produced really well, which is kind of another thing, I guess, I just didn't like all that early metal stuff because I didn't like the fact it sounded like one microphone in a garage. And it was like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, I mean, And Justice for All or Early Pantera. <sighs> great songs, great bands, but I mean, production value, one could argue that they don't sound well. Yeah, I, there's maybe something about that kind of guitar tone that didn't really do it for me, so I just didn't really bother with it. Um, but yeah, listening to Killswitch and, and their, their kind of buzz, I was just like, okay, right, now I've found something metal a bit more heavy that I can start to get into and, and stuff like that. And I think a lot of the way they used to write songs or still do um, sort of influenced me in how I would compartmentalize how I would write the instrumental stuff. So I was like, okay, right, cool. I can just take like the screaming verses and have those as like the shred parts. And then I could, I, I could have like these choruses that were more melodic and had like, you know, almost the hook that everyone would get into. And then you'd sort of piece your technique and, and, and stuff around that. So I started messing around with that idea. And I guess that's something that stuck with me in terms of like how I, um, how I write a lot of my stuff, like right. even now, you know, right. Absolutely. I find absolutely. Well, it's a good balance. It's, it's a way for me to like balance my, my music. So it was like, you know, people could listen to it. They could get a bit of the technique side of things. And then you could, you could bring in a more musical part of the song and, and all of a sudden it would make sense. So you'd have like a tension release sort of thing. You'd have all this kind of frantic playing that would open out. Um, and to me that, that seemed like an attractive way of, of creating stuff. So, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it, that just that last point you just said i mean even up until very recently when you released your uh tonality plugin with stl tones you had the three unreleased tracks i mean the the song unleashed i mean that was 
un, the unofficial, at least in my eyes, like the theme song of, of that release of the plugin and, and the Revenant pedal yeah. coming out. You know what I mean? Like that song yeah. was, was, was everywhere in terms of the marketing and, you know, et cetera. Um, and what you just said was, was certainly prevalent there as well as, you know, the other two is like, you know, the verses quote unquote is, you know, you're shredding, but then there would always be a hook, you know, and, and, or something for the listener to grab onto. And then you would repeat it two or three times, you know, it'd almost be like chorus, verse, chorus, you know, just like a structured, more structured song. It's not very progressive per se, but it still highlights and showcases your abilities. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I did, um, I did dip my toe into doing slightly more progressive stuff, like a, no, absolutely. I'm just I was um, just home for those those examples. No, I no, I, I mean I tried it, and I, I think for me I just wasn't really that fussed with you know like eight. I I think the challenge there was to try and make or try and write another eight or ten minute long song. It's hard to, keep to memorize it interesting all that. Interesting by the end, I know, and <laughs> like and then and then you start playing live and you start doing clinics and you're just like oh you yeah. know I want to enjoy this. I don't want to be like yeah. It's like at minutes yeah. at minute seven. I'm out, I'm on the 14th fret, you know, like, yeah, it's it, like, how do you, I, I always, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of dudes out there now that play, just, they just like, their song just goes from like start to finish and there's no reoccurring theme and like they play it spot on every time. I, I personally don't know how they can physically memorize that stuff. I mean, it's, it's yeah. crazy. I think it just depends on your approach. I mean, like I don't remember individual notes of songs that right. I play. That, that it normally comes in like sections, and then the muscle memory just takes care of the the, the micro details of it. And I mean, obviously, you're listening to it as well because every so often I'll get a brain fart and forget what I'm doing. So it, it's also important to practice the improvisational side of things, just so you can know what key you're in. Yeah. So, like, if things do go horribly wrong, you can still pull yourself out of it and just make it look like a creative choice on stage. Yeah, absolutely. Rather than a fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> you, you hit a C sharp and C major, and then you know, it, I always, I was always taught. I don't know if you can um, speak on this. Like, if you hit a wrong note, like I said, like you're in C major, C sharp doesn't fit in the key. Like, if you would hit it like one or two more times to make it look like you did it on purpose, and then get the fuck out of there, like, and then like bounce back to where you were. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, if you hit a wrong note, you can either go a fret up or fret down. Yeah, yeah. You'd probably be in. So it's like you, know, <laughs> you you can just hear the split seconds. <laughs> yeah, it's like and oh, then shit. Go in. get out of there. But yeah, I don't know. I think I used to really worry about that stuff. Like I trained myself to the point where I'd I'd almost robotically be able to get through songs from start to finish, and you know, and be like, oh, if the performance wasn't a hundred percent perfect, I'd be gutted with myself and it'd just be a shit performance right it's funny how that kind of i mean obviously I, i'd never let it get to the point where i just get through whole songs and it just sounds like i'm fisting my way through it you know what i mean and yeah. not really getting any like definition in there but like i don't know um i feel like now i'm quite happy for that to happen sometimes just to sort of it makes it it makes it interesting feel, for you you know what i mean like it's a bit more human i suppose yeah absolutely like, I mean, I don't. I haven't done a huge amount of like live playing lately, but I remember I um, I did Tech Fest not so long ago, which was like a UK festival, absolutely, just for, like yeah, a yeah. three piece. And uh, I did one song, Equinox, and I completely. I mean, th this is the problem with playing with backing tracks as well. Is if you've got harmonies and things that follow what you're meant to be playing, uh, yeah, uh -oh. they're not gonna <laughs> they're not gonna change for you no matter what. Yeah. So, but I just completely had like this thing on stage where I, was, I just didn't play the song at all the way it was meant to go and i was just like Do you know what that was actually quite fun just to <laughs> just to kind of feel my way through it rather than i mean the worst time that happened was uh being on stage with petrucci guthrie govern and uh tosin abasin and all of that and oh, doing man. the john petrucci camp where like we had to get up and and because we didn't even have a chance to like jam through that song we were just about to and then but we were late for like the classes and they're, they're very strictly scheduled, obviously, because I got a lot to fit in. Right. So we had to stop what we were doing, go to class or whatever. But we knew the chord progression. So I was just like, oh, God, you know, this is going to be a bad day at the office <laughs> if it goes wrong. Like, do you know what I mean? Especially yeah. being on stage with that lot. So when, we, when right. it came to it, I said to John, I was just like, look, I'm going to go first because I just I don't want to follow no one up here. Like, right. I'm just going to get on with it and do it. But, it, you know. As times like that, I suppose you, you should just trust yourself a little bit more, maybe, because it, it turned out it was all right in the end. But um, 
Yeah, it's just yeah. It's, you almost psych yourself out trying to be a perfectionist. But at the end of the day, it is art. It's not. It's not a science. You know what I mean? Like, you can still. You, you know, you always want to do your best. You want to perform your best. But at the end of the day, man, like a, even a mistake is an artistic expression in a way. And yeah. as long as you can make sense of it and like work your way around it and land on your feet, you know, a bar or two later, like nobody, nobody really except you, the performer is going to really notice and care. You know what I mean? No, I feel like um, the the culture now, the, the, the way it is, you know, I mean, you've got, you've got players that are playing some, ridiculously scary things that you're like how the hell do they do that I mean like Jason Richardson for example yeah absolutely it's like, I mean that's all real as well you know what I mean there's no trickery going on there and you're like fucking you know I mean again that that's beyond way beyond what, like where I'd go with something but I have sat down and looked at some of the stuff he's done and taken it on board in my, in my own thing um, but just kind of how I would approach some of the things he does or whatever but yeah that, you know there, there, but there is this thing going on i think that like isn't real I've, I've been seeing it more and more recently i suppose i i you know I've, I've been seeing it with with like these kid drummers like playing mashuga like note for note beat for beat on the drums and like they're like they can't even see over like the snare so like i haven't seen it with guitar per se but like i certainly have seen some stuff that's like i, I don't know man i don't know it looks a little looks a little funky there it looks a little off yeah I don't know. But um, no, I think, you know, I, I think it's just important to, you know, maybe keep that in mind that it's all right to fuck up now and again. Yeah, absolutely. I've mean, got a whole, there's a whole gig. I mean, if anyone's watching this, they could probably type it in. But I did a whole gig with sac- uh, my old band Sacred Mother Tongue once. And uh, it's probably still on YouTube somewhere, but it's it's like live at the Gasworks in Leeds, right? If anyone's interested, just type it into YouTube. And I, I think I'll probably play the whole gig a fret down from or a fret up from where it should have been oh man like and uh, there was one point where there was a song and there was a guitar solo at the, at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> and i was just like i had to sit on the front of this i mean i'd, I'd had a skin full as well i was proper like drunk yeah okay so so that's in my defense that's it but i mean honestly like do you know what? and I, at the time i was so like oh my god i can't believe this has gone out i can't believe it's gone out you know and then but now i watch it and i just laugh it's just so funny it is funny man i mean yeah, but, like, like you said it's okay to be humid at the end of the day i mean you're yeah. extremely proficient as is a lot of other players but there's nothing wrong with showing a bit of humility in your in your art and in your your performance yeah so uh, <laughs> that's funny so yeah i don't know where we got up to really but yeah, it just kind uh, of went off on one yeah i mean i like i said off camera and off off you know off the air like i said i have a whole bunch of stuff written down but we're not following any of it but um I do have a couple talking points I would like to talk about. Um, one would be your YouTube channel currently, and more particular, this this song you put out. Well, it was a, it was a cover you put out on this past Halloween. Um, oh t- yeah, touched the, a lot the, of people. Really, sister. yeah, really, really cool. I was, I was, if you don't mind, it's somewhat of no. a of a personal, you know, creation that video. I was wondering if you could just elaborate on, on that and just talk about it a little bit. Um. Yeah, well, I, to be honest with you, it come round so quick. Like, I just, I, d- I didn't really realise, like, what time of year it was because I was like, I've got a bunch of things going on at the minute, um, you know, like, with writing and trying to get stuff down. And um, it was, like, the anniversary of my, my dad dying, um, which was, it wasn't exactly on Halloween. It was slightly before when we found out. Right, right. But, uh, yeah, I, you know, I can't believe it's it's been, it's been, a, you know, that, period of time has passed already it's just you know nuts but yeah i kind of thought i had in my mind like i thought well you know how am i gonna you know sort of try and at least like commemorate it i didn't really i i, I tried sitting down and working on something and it, nothing was coming and i've been going for a bit of a dry spell at the moment anyway um because I'm, I'm currently boxing stuff up and moving house and there's just a bunch of other stuff going on which it is kind of diverting my focus away from actually sitting and, and concentrating on actually writing some music. Right. So, um, I started jamming on this thing anyway, and it was another song that I'd written. It wasn't, it wasn't that song at all. And I started this tapping thing and it sounded, I was just like, why does that sound so familiar to me? Like, and then I kind of took a break and went and got a drink or whatever. And then it just hit me what, what it was. So I, I went to the, um, I went on iTunes and I played the song and I was just like, yeah, that, that is it. Cause I, I remember it from 
when I was a kid, I was just like, you know, I, I love the 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 sort of like the change in it and the and the dark part. And I suppose it, it was kind of metal without really or heavy without really being heavy, if you know what I mean. I just kind of liked it. Um, yeah. And I remember at the time, you know, it was because obviously there was the uh, English show um, Top of the Pops where it was like a chart rundown of like all the different bands and stuff. And sometimes they would play or they would mime live on stage or they would submit a video that would be played in its place. So it wouldn't always be a stage performance. Some of it would be that and some of it would be video. Okay. And this video came on. And I was just like, you know, it just, it, I mean, it resonated with a lot of people when it came out because it was a massive hit or whatever. So like yeah, I was doing this thing, and then I listened to the song, and I was just like, oh god, yeah, that sounds exactly the same. First of all, I was like, well, I can't use that because it's already been used. And then I thought, well, I've never really done like a sort of deconstructive instrumental cover of any other song. So I thought, oh no, I'll give it a go. So I, I exported the song, I put it into Cubase, and then I just wrote very basic piano chords just to map out the song, just so I could give myself a um, a window in which to sort of like work towards with the changes and all that kind of stuff. And then I just started adding to it. I deleted the MP3 out because I didn't want to copy it too much. Um, apart from like little things, like there's a, there's obvious things in there, like the pianos and stuff yeah. that need to be in there. But um, yeah, I just started building on it with like some choirs some bits of piano here and there, some um, guitar stuff. And I didn't really know how I was going to approach it. I just sort of, felt my way through it really and did it and I, I felt I felt like at the time of doing it I was just like oh, do you know what this would actually be a really good song to dedicate towards the memory of my dad so I thought well I don't know it's pretty organic I didn't really plan it it just sort of happened and then as as I started doing it and um I don't know I was, I was surprised at how it came out but initially I was thinking oh is this just going to get like laughed at or is this just going to be like, you know, what is he doing? Like, why would, why would he do this kind of thing? So I, I started having a bit of a, um, a bit of a, a, a serious doubting as to whether I should even put it out or whatever, because you know what social media is like nowadays. It's ridiculous. Really. You should probably just be like, oh, do you know what? Fuck it. I don't care what anyone else thinks, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Right. Kind of thing. But I don't know for me, sometimes I'll just, I don't really want to put something out that you get behind and then it just gets trashed by people that they don't really give a shit about what you're trying to say or what you're trying to do. They just, they're just doing it just to be horrible. And I, yes. I don't really understand that mentality, but there you go. Just, just, a, so, just an evil mentality for the sake, just for the sake of being mean because whatever's going on. I mean, it's like the, you know, the, it's the whole cliche thing that everybody deals with from the time they're five years old in grade school till, you know, whenever it's just, there's always just people out there that don't want to see other people doing well or be creative or like taking a risk. And so it's, it, yeah. it doesn't I mean, go away. It, it happens. I'm not like crying about it or anything. I'm just like, yeah, whatever, you know, it's fine. Right. But, um, I think sometimes it, it does impede your confidence into just going, no, nah, I'm going to do that. Sod it. So, um, I don't know. Anyway, I had the song and I'd finished it. I'd, I'd finished mixing it and everything. Uh, and then I was in, uh, I was playing some stuff to my mate in the car. We'd just been down the pub or whatever on our usual Sunday night out. And I was just like, oh yeah, I was just playing in some songs and stuff in the car, mainly because I wanted to hear how it sounded. Right. And then afterwards I just sort of said, oh yeah, I said, I, I did this cover of this song and I told him what it was. And he was like, Oh yeah, go on then. <laughs> so I was like, "Oh god, here we go." I said, "You're literally the first person that's heard this because, like, my wife ain't even heard it." Like, I, I mean, probably, a, I, I, I might have mentioned it, but I didn't play it to anybody. I, I was the only person that had heard this right. this version that I'd done, and I played it to him, and he was just at the end of it. He was like, "Mate." He said, you have to put that out. It is epic. And I was just like, really? Because when you get that close to something, you can't really see the wood for the trees. You don't really have that feeling, I suppose, of first hearing it that someone else might. So I think his reaction was 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 enough for me to go, all right, yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just stick to my guns and, and put it out and, and do the whole commemorative thing that I was going to do anyway and just – hope people like it sort of thing right it's just like it was you know I, I you know i'm very sorry about you know the unfortunate terrible circumstances of yeah yeah i mean it happens i mean right. you know he was 80 it was like 
Yeah. It, it was going to happen anyway, you it, know. It, do, it doesn't make it any easier, but it's like, it was just, you know, it was, it was a cool, you know, I'm subscribed to your channel or whatever, but it was just like a cool, a cool way to like commemorate somebody because I, I guess it resonated with a lot of people, myself included. I lost my father to cancer like four and a half, five years ago, something like that. So like, yeah. when somebody takes that risk of like, you know, that extreme amount of exposure and like vulnerability and like turn it into something as something that you did. I thought that was, that was really cool. And something that I don't know, not too many people are, are willing to take the risk and, and, and pull off and you know what I mean? And you did it, you know, flawlessly, at least in my eyes. So it was, it was oh, awesome. Cheers, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I guess, I guess that's, I'm kind of glad it went over. All right. <laughs> yeah abs absolutely everybody loved but, it man. Uh, i suppose it, again as well it's like if it wasn't for him kind of you know i mean let's face it we're talking about 130 quid which is fuck all on the grand scheme of things but yeah. it's not really the money it's more it's more the the willingness to kind of back an idea yeah, not just, knowing and, where where it will go and i think that's kind of the power of like especially someone like a parent or a mentor or anybody they just give you that little bit of a uh, of a chance to see where something goes and honestly you know when you look back 25 years later or whatever it's just i don't know it can kind of make you feel emotional really how Absolutely. how it kind of progresses Absolutely. from that one moment to like now and i suppose the only way i could really um convincingly convey my gratitude is through music because i'm not very good with I, you know, me sitting there and talking to camera would have just been a waste of time. You know what I mean? So yeah, and, and although you, I, I certainly believe you could have, you know, certainly talked in front of the camera and be like, okay, this is this has been the anniversary, whatever, whatever. But just um, your your ability to convey emotion through through music just speaks, you know, infinitely because you have you have the natural gift and talent of of pulling that off, man. So it just well, that's I, been an upward battle as well, especially because obviously when you come out the gate as like someone that's trying to, you know, prove that you've got all this ability and stuff like that, I guess it's taken a while for me to get into people's minds that that's not all I'm about. You know what I mean? So that's been an uphill personal battle for me as well. It's like you make a rod for your own back, you get known as one thing. And then it's very hard to change people's minds once they associate a certain style, which is, you know, playing really fast. I suppose to a lot of people that's expressionless doesn't convey feeling doesn't do anything other than just you know playing scales up and down or whatever it is that people say about that type of playing you know what i mean yeah. so you know Th that that is that is a, a, that is just a derivative of people i i really i truly believe that's just nothing but jealous hate hateful people that play bar chords in their in their in their parents basement i really do believe like i don't understand how somebody could say playing at the extreme speeds that you do isn't isn't filled with emotion and like like you said what 10 15 minutes ago it's about the tension and release of the music you know you you have all this tension with you know sweeping arpeggios at you know 64th note runs and then land on you know a two-step bend and have that giant release that epic release into like those hooks yeah. that you're talking about i mean i i, I don't I don't buy that for one second. That that argument. yeah. I mean, I you know, I mean, but to be honest with you, there are people that do understand that style of playing and still don't give it any credence <sighs> whatsoever, which yeah. is fine. You know, I mean, I don't. It's like look. I mean, at the end of the day, right? Music is as simple as it is to me as I think it probably should be to everyone else. It's like, do you like it? And there's two words: yes or no. Right. That's it. I mean, you know, you can sit and debate all day long whether you, you know whether why this is good why that is good or anything like that but you're kind of largely wasting your breath really when it's all subjective to the individual so you know i mean like what i was saying before you know when you worry about what people think when you put stuff out i guess i've just kind of contradicted myself in terms of like well it don't really matter because if i'm into it then fuck it i'm just going to put it out and 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 that's it but i yeah. suppose it's not really it's not really the doubt in in, in your abilities so much as it is just subjecting yourself to accidentally seeing a comment that might ruin your day yeah know. but and it's funny isn't i think it's funny like how you get 
you'll get thousands of positives, but you'll get one negative one, and that negative one will, will eat at you and not. Oh, of course. And, and like, yeah, I hate, I hate that. I, I, it's just like human nature, but like I hate that. Like when you get one hate comment, it says, "Oh, like uh, fuck you, dude." Something like that has, <laughs> that has like no thought behind it. Like, ah, oh, fuck you, you suck. But it's like, man, fuck you, you suck. You know what I mean? It's like, why do you have to come at me and say all this hate? And but then you know, it's it's just funny how like the mind works. Where like you pay attention initially, you pay attention to all. The, the negative or the one negative but then like you just gotta like shut that part of your brain off and focus on you know millions of people or you know however many people care you know in a positive manner yeah exactly i mean i have had scenarios where someone's done that and then you know you kind of not got into it a little bit so i try not to you know get into arguments with people sometimes like <laughs> it's hard if you're out if you're out and you're having a couple of drinks and someone says something and you're just like oh, do you know what? i'm gonna let this guy have it but like <laughs> generally i don't i don't really entertain it too much but sometimes if I have or whatever, and then it kind of just stops or ends or whatever, there'll be a DM the next day going, oh, I'm really sorry, man. Like, my life is just total shit at the moment. And I just I just chose to, like, talk shit on your video for no reason other than I was just being horrible for the sake of it. And pe- some people have actually admitted that. And you kind of wonder, like, whether that is actually quite um, true of a lot of cases where that happens, where, like, the individual is actually not doing it from a place of power or strength at all it's more from a place of fuck i hate my life i'm just gonna make <laughs> someone feel as miserable as i do so i'm just gonna unleash a tirade of abuse online yeah, it's i don't i don't know man i don't i get i totally get it and i you know you, you, it's hard to it's hard not to to come back at them tenfold i mean i think everybody has done it or does do it but mm. i don't know man i just, i don't know well, i know you've been on the receiving end of that as well oh I mean, my god yeah. details but <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's how I first heard about you, actually, because I'd, I'd never, I had no idea, and then I was just like, oh, "Right, what is this?" Yeah. And I guess it kind of took the internet by storm for about a week. <laughs> I know. I was like, "Dude, I'm just like, I just want to hang out and just play my guitar." And then next thing you know, I, I'm getting like threatened lawsuits. But you know, anyway, mm. that's that's all water, water under the bridge. I'm just forever that guy. But oh well. No, nah, no, I mean, I bring it up just to go, oh, yeah, you're that guy. It was just, I don't know. <laughs> well, oddly enough, that's how um, STL Tones found me or, you know, contacted me. It was just that that was my catalyst. That was, you know, you had the, well, there you go. You Every had the cloud, shred con- didn't it? You had the shred contest. I had somebody accusing me of stealing. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Oh, well. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, everything kind of happens for a reason, doesn't it, really? I mean, it's funny how things pan out. I think it's just like I, I think that's the cool thing about getting older is you do just let the chips fall where they may a little bit more and you try not to strangle the life out of something even if you want something not really bad and you put yourself in a position where that could or couldn't happen you still maintain the mentality of like well I don't know let's just see what happens and if it doesn't then cool I'll just move on to the next thing I feel like the less I've like unofficially given a toss about something it normally evens out and i don't mean that in a negative way i just mean like i used to get like really wound up about oh god i really hope this happens i hope this happens or oh, blah blah oh no this has to happen or oh, oh, my life's over kind of thing and and you know i just don't get like that anymore you know you would just build up like self self-made ultimatums like well if i don't you know if this doesn't happen then well then you know my music career is over or something like that. Like, yeah. Like it, would, it would go to that extreme in, in your head where in reality it's like, it's nothing as serious as it, as it seems. No, I mean, you know, it's, I watch, um, I watch this guy called Gary V or Vaynerchuk or whatever on, on Instagram. And it, it kind of props up a lot of my own like mental battles with like, um, you know, exception, acceptance and, and, and having, or being told no over being told yes. And how, how you can kind of actually look at the, the no is actually it's a more positive response from somebody than getting a yes. Because if you always get a yes and you never get a no, there's, I don't think as much growth happens in in how you uh, you know grow as a person or an artist or whatever it is that you're trying to do in life. I feel like the more no's you get, the better you'll get. And then finally when you get that yes, you'll be ready for it. Absolutely. I, yeah. It's just like, you know, you have no character, character development if you don't have any hardships and if you don't have anybody tell you, oh, you're no good. You know, yeah, yeah. If, if somebody says, always tells you you're great, you're not, then you're like, well, I'm great. And you have no room for improvement because you get in false validation from whoever. 
yeah exactly so i don't know keep keeping that kind of mindset seems to have helped a little bit as well with say like surviving in the industry and and maybe just being because i'm quite happy with like where i am at the moment i mean i don't earn like millions or even hundreds of thousands or whatever do you know what i mean i just Mm -hmm. kind of tick along make enough money to like be able to do music as a living and i don't you know i'm thankful that i don't have to do something i don't want to do in order to bring in money do you know what i mean so and then it's some go ahead i'm sorry go ahead ahead. no no it's all right i I don't know what i was gonna say (laughs) i was just gonna say it's like it's just like the the cliche thing of like you know, um, if you're like a millionaire, but you hate your life, like, are you even really successful as opposed to like making, you know, I don't know, just, just enough to get by, but you're doing what you love. You know, it's like, I find it hard for people not to choose the happiness, but some people just get caught up in the monetary side of things. Yeah. I I don't know. Like I'm not, I don't really kind of worry about all that to be honest with you. Like, I mean, even if I was a multimillionaire, my life wouldn't be any different than it is now. I'd probably live in a slightly bigger house and drive a slightly better car. But I mean, it's not, I mean, I, I just bought a car that's new that's this year. You know what I mean? I'm like, and it's what I wanted. It's not something that I'm driving because I didn't want to drive, you know, do you know what I mean? But it's like, right. even after a week, I was like, I'm bored of this. No, I, don't really care. <laughs> I could have just gone back to my old car and it's all right. Right, right. So, yeah, I think it definitely is to do with more with how you feel about yourself, I think, than, than anything else. And that's where the real work comes in. Because if you could just be happy doing doing that, then you'll be all right. It doesn't really matter. So yeah, like I, I you know, I do things like um, I got a guitar out with Kiesel, uh, obviously plugging out with STL and the Kemper tones and stuff. I mean, the Kemper tones, like it's funny. My introduction to um, STL, it again, it was it, it wasn't planned. It wasn't like me going, oh yeah, if I did this, then this will happen or. You know, again, going back to what I was saying before, if I try and plan the stuff out or want something too badly, it just never seems to pan out. But like, I didn't do anything other than just do like a clean demo. Because like my uh, old singer Chris, he he sent me a link via Instagram, and he was just like, "Oh, check out these clean tones. I reckon you'll like them." And I was just like, "Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll check it out later." Uh, and then he he asked me again, going, "Oh, have you checked out them tones yet?" And I was just like. No, I, I I haven't, mate. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is often the case with me. Like, I, I just get it takes me ages to get around to hearing or seeing anything. Right. Um, and then I think the th- like third time I was actually working on something where I needed a really decent clean tone, and I just didn't, I didn't have access to it. So I, I remembered I had this message in my inbox. So I clicked on it, and it was this Sky Dreams thing. And I heard the tones, and I was oh, fuck. I've got, to, I, I've got to get this. <laughs> I had a Kemper, but not for. I hadn't had it long. Yeah. Um, so I just got these tones, I loaded them in, and it was literally perfect for what I wanted. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I just started sitting down. I think it was like a late night thing. And I started playing these chords or whatever, and it sounded pretty cool. So I just laid it down, and then I did like a solo over the top of it, and I filmed it. It was only like a minute and a half or something. It wasn't very long. Um, and I just called it Sky Dreams because I didn't know what else to call it, really. And I stuck, I stuck it on Facebook or whatever. Right. And it it just had an insane response. Yeah, like, it's like it, it, you were like you were like almost like unofficially like the STL tones, you know, Kemper dude. You know what I mean? Like just by. Well, I don't think I don't think STL had been in going long. Um, no, I don't. Yeah, at I don't, the time. I, I, don't, I personally don't. But yeah, but I don't. I don't think so. No. So I, I sort of did that, and uh, Sonny was telling me, um, Mister STL <laughs> was telling me. Uh, <laughs> Um, about it when I was over doing the, the promo for the, the, you know, for the plugin just come out and um, he was saying to me, he was like, oh, you know, I went to bed and I got up and this thing had had like 20, 30,000 views and like the orders were coming in. He's just like, fucking holy <laughs> shit, you know, what is, what's going on? Like? Right. So it kind of blew up almost overnight. It was insane. Uh, I think the, the, the Facebook video ended up with like a million plus views or something. That's it insane. It's just savage. But yeah, he, uh, he contacted me and said, oh, you know, um, it's, it, it's sort of like did really well or whatever and um, thanks for like posting it up I, I don't remember the conversation it was like four years ago or something right but um i know he just said to me oh you know we're thinking of doing a kemper pack with you would you be interested and i was like yeah of course i would be yeah why not yeah so uh hired out studio did, did a bunch of tones and stuff and then uh and then yeah but i mean it's still one of the top sellers, I think, for STL. So it's just yeah, nuts. one of if not the just and it you know just 
I don't know if it's just right timing, right, you know, right place, right time or what, but yeah, it's just like when I came on board, um, Sonny told me, it's just like, yeah, like Andy's pack just, it sells, man. It always sells. And, you know, for whatever reason it's, I mean, I mean, for, besides the obvious of, you know, you're an incredible player, but I'm, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's just like you. Yeah. But it doesn't always equate to like, cause that's the thing as well. Like sometimes that could probably have an adverse effect if you, if you associate, uh, uh, this is what I was saying earlier about the, the shredder connotation. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, well I don't want to use that tone because it's not going to be right for, for this. Whereas it's kind of nuts because the plug in itself, um, you know, irrespective of the Kemper pack, which does cover um, probably not as many bases as say like this plug in does because of the, the versatility across the whole, all the amps and stuff. Right. It's still like, I mean, my father-in-law uses it, uses it for like a, a very kind of soft rock uh, band that he goes out, he does sessions for is also another like original band. He, and he uses like my lead tone for that. And it's, you know, it's not just a metal lead tone. It works for all, all sorts, all sorts of stuff. Right. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's probably more to do with the fact that, you know, people have tried it out probably initially based on if they're a fan or whatever, but if they're not and they've tried the tones, they've probably just done it on the basis of the, they just came out really well. I mean, I, I still use a, a bunch of those like tones and stuff. I mean, most notably for, um, the last album that I did, you know, that was all STL stuff. For, uh, Arrival? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then, so how did, how did, okay, so you have your own signature camper pack, your, your know, XFX tones, you're doing, everything's doing well. How did the conversation come about to, to where you were contacted to get your own signature uh, <laughs> plugin? Well, I mean, not that I want to take credit for them doing plugins in the beginning, <laughs> but I said to Sonny, like, but <laughs> years ago, I was like, mate, you got to do, a pl- you got to do plugins, you got to do, and he was like, yeah, you know, we're looking into it. At the time, I think funding was like a big issue and didn't really know what they were, what they were going to do. And I was just like, mate, you've got to get this stuff into a plugin. It, it's, it's kind of blowing up and, I was kind of getting into it myself, um, you know, with the whole sort of now the mix thing and really starting to take it seriously with the whole, you know, mixing and production side of stuff. So I was getting more into plugins. And then obviously when you insert yourself into that world, you see all these new things that are coming out and you're just like, oh, yeah, STL really needs to get on that. So I guess I think he had it in his mind anyway. I'm not I'm not like <laughs> I'm not going to take credit for that. I'm only joking. But I think uh, I was secretly hoping that one day they would actually get um, get the green light and figure out how they were going to do it and then actually do it. So, yeah, um, I mean, they went. Uh, they did the Howard Benson and and obviously you know with, with, with those guys I mean they're they're more audio guys anyway like Howard Benson I mean like the records he's worked on right. and obviously Will Putney as well is like a, you know a proper buzz producer at the moment like he's putting out some killer stuff and you know those guys are known for producing records that uh, you know thousands and thousands of people have heard so I guess it kind of makes sense to make an audio plug-in with people like that to you know, branch out and, and go, Hey, you know, here's a, here's a plugin that can fit really well into your workflow of your productions, you know, basically aiming it more at people that do that kind of thing, I suppose. And, right. um, you know, as well as, you know, guitar players as well, they're obviously going to get like loads out of it if you just play guitar and stuff. But I think the focus with, with bringing mine out was more to do with the fact that if you are a guitar player and not so much known for the, production side of things which i'm not you know i do all my own stuff and i've i've done some shocking sounding records that have been my own thing where i didn't know what i was doing and there was no budget and i just had to do it if otherwise no music would go out you know what i mean yeah absolutely so you know i suppose i've done i've done bits and pieces like for for people but i'm not like i'm not a mixer that works for bands and uh, and does all you know like putney does or whatever so i'm more known for being a guitar player so it was like okay well let's do something that is geared more towards people that play and want to plug in and get great tone that possibly don't want to sit there faffing around with an eq forevermore um to get a tone that will sit really well in a mix or be good for demos or whatever it is that you're, you're doing um and not break the bank either you know in terms of like i mean if you price up all three of them heads that we modeled Oh my I mean, God, you're yeah. talking you're talking a ridiculous amount of money for someone that just wants to record a, uh, an awesome sounding demo or whatever, and then 
maybe for pre-production or whatever it is and then go in the studio and do it but even then that process would probably be less than paying for the amps yeah pay, paying maybe. as well as time too i mean you know time you know time in the studio i mean that, setting up the amp is and getting the tones that's a full day in itself almost yeah you know exactly I mean? yeah not just the amp heads but the cabs and the mics yeah, the mics and, the room everything everything yeah so so yeah it's definitely geared towards people that just want to plug in get an awesome time straight away and not have to worry about whether it's good or not um i mean you know you can still tweak it because the great thing about that plugin is you can just tweak it and it actually reacts like the amp that it's modeled after yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. And, 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 it, and it's very like you know it's just it's not like super compressed or like you know amp one on, or even amp two um on your on your on your plugin like you know those are modeled yeah. after high gain amps but like you can clean it up and let your right hand be your almost your volume control like yeah. where, where it's the very dynamic and it's not like you know you're on one or 0.5 on the on the preamp knob and like it's automatically you know at 11 you know what i mean yeah no i, I get i'll get what you're saying it's it's still giving you that tone that you want just in a more sort of controlled um in a more controlled way because yeah like some valve amps they do go from zero to like ridiculous i mean most notably a laney that i used to have it was like a VH100. It just went from like naught, and then on one, it would literally kill people if you got to. I was just like, how does this? There's no, there's no in between. You know, right? right? Yeah, it's just like it has one setting go. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I suppose it's different, like because obviously we've got the Kemper pack stuff as well. But the Kemper is slightly different in terms of like obviously it's profiling the tone where you dial it in, and when you capture that tone, that's how you want it in that moment, and and. I guess I was just lucky with with my tones that we got that even though they were static tones taken from that particular session that they are quite malleable even if you want to EQ after the fact like for anything for a production or whatever. Some guitar tones don't play well with post EQ and then you're like, well, this is just completely falling apart. Right. So the other thing that I found with the Kempo is like you can – Say like you get a 5150 or whatever it is and you and you get the tone that you want. If you start EQing it on the Kemper, obviously the, the Kemper's EQ algorithm doesn't work the same or react the same as how the actual amp that you've modelled or profiled would work. So if you're adding in more low end, it's more Kemper low end than 5150 low end to a tone that wasn't Kemper in the first place. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's just like you're, you're mixing and matching and it's not like it's not correlating and it's not reacting accurately, you know, however, whatever, whatever word I'm looking for, you know, it's, yeah, like, it, it it's it, most notable in the low end. Like I, I, I feel like, you know, we captured plenty of low end in those Kemper tones where you could just leave it as is, and then you can roll it off with an EQ afterwards and it still sounds pretty weighty. Whereas if we'd have done it on the light side of things and you're trying to add the low end back in with the Kemper, it, I don't know. It wouldn't. It wouldn't have been quite as good. I don't think so. Yeah. We were definitely mindful of that because we used like a boundary mic um, underneath, you know, which is like a pressure sensor uh, mic that we. I think it was like a Beta ninety one or something. I don't know. It was like a flat square looking thing, and we put it underneath the the four by twelve just to get some of that kind of three D weight into the tone. Right, just like that really low end sub. Yeah, it's not even like really. It's not even like a distinguishable sound per se but it's just like it's just there you know what yeah. i mean yeah so uh yeah i'm you know i'm really glad at how that came out but yeah the, the, i mean the plugin turned out amazing i mean i, I use it like every day like absolutely some pieces and, and and stuff as well um now so what um what were the essential elements in your plugin that you needed i mean obviously we have the finished product now so i can assume you know what's in it is what you wanted but i mean like what was your thought process behind like okay you know i need like two high gain amps the revenant the clean you know what i mean like i would just like to know going into the creation like how much input you had on to what would be in it and what needed to be in it etc well yeah we um you know we discussed the sort of like types of sounds that i like and uh and you know the kind of amps that i like and stuff like that and all the amps that have been featured in this plug-in are amps that i've gravitated towards when i've you know, when I've because I haven't done a huge amount of like actual valve amp like playing and, and miking up and all that kind of stuff, but when I have, they're the amps that seem to pull out the tone that I'm after. Do you know what I mean? So right, it's absolutely. like, okay, well, if we're gonna if we're gonna take like the the, the real amp approach and do that, then these have got to be the ones that we're we're doing. 
Um, but the AC30 was because of the Sky Dreams thing and how well that came out. Right, and that's what I figured. That's, like... Sun, that's Sonny's amp, and, and he was like, well, this is literally the best AC30 I've ever plugged into, so we're going to track the schematics of that and make sure it, it works um, the, the same way. And I was like, well, yeah, if you can, if you can do something that literally gets that tone and it's something that you can alter and change and you know people can dial it in how they want or whatever but it still essentially keeps that sort of thing then yeah let's do it you know absolutely so you know we went through a load of beta versions of it and you know semi because when you get like the versions of the plug-in it looks very different than the final thing you get like these 2d things that don't look very <laughs> interesting at all yeah it's like, like uh, it's almost like N6- south park amp. yeah 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 exactly i was gonna say like some old like old school game boy uh, graphics are like n64 or even beyond yeah. that yeah that's so funny so so yeah you're like how am i gonna get it but then you plug in you know like, okay this 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 is sounding good already right so yeah you sort of like dial in some tones i did a bit of recording and then you know this like how we sort of made the, the cabs and the presets and stuff like that um <clears throat> trying to sort of capture tones that i'd managed to get for like recording that i thought okay this is going to work if someone loads it up and you put it into a song um so yeah, like some of the cab IRs and stuff like that were taken post EQ right, afterwards. Okay. So it was kind of like baked in in terms of like, um, well, look, there's a nasty frequency here or whatever. Take that out, and then in the cab IR, it's not present or whatever. So, so yeah, we were. I wanted I wanted to kind of like do that to limit the amount of processing you would need to do to any of those tones to to be you know really usable or whatever. Right, and it, it just goes back to your saying of like you want you don't want to. Uh you don't want to be spending tons of times messing with an EQ or whatever, you know, you just want to have stuff out of the box, so to speak, good to go. And then having the confidence that it's going to sound sick immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's always something that I want, you know, if I've got to spend longer than five minutes dialing in a tone, it ain't going to work. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. want to sit there. I don't want to sit there for hours and hours and hours on end, like dialing in. I mean, although I do like working on audio, I like creating, I like trying to, I like being creative. I don't really want to sit there and do all of that. Right. Um, technical stuff you know too much and then when you have a spike of of creativity you don't want to take the time to 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 lose that creative spike dialing in an amp like you want to be good to go and then knowing it's going to sound amazing you don't even have to worry about what 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 tone you're going to have to get it's already there exactly yeah i mean I, i love being in a recording session where like um everything sounds mixed when i'm recording it i don't i hate that like when you go in and you've got like I've been in situations in studios before where you've got like really raw drums and then like you've got to play to that and there's no volume to it and then you've got like really dry bass and it's just like oh god this is the most uninspiring thing <laughs> right so I I, I I I kind of pre-mix up like up a template I'll just play any old shit I don't write anything and then I'll, I'll work on you know like I'll I usually with my mixing style or whatever which is not original it's just <laughs> stuff that i've seen other people do it's like you start with your mastering bus and you work backwards right so yeah i don't like working up to that point i'm much like, i mean if i've ever mixed anything for everybody anybody as well normally what i'll do is if i'm gonna if i'm gonna use like real drums in a production for someone i'll program all the drums in with sounds that i know or that i like that are just all one shot samples and stuff and i'll mix around that and then i'll wind the kit back in and then take out the bits that i've put in just so i know where i am okay. I, I, I i never understand how people can just start with a raw kick drum and go oh yeah this needs this this needs this and then it goes through like thousands of different processes when you get to the mastering stage when you're turning it all up and gluing it all together i'm like how does anyone like know where to put a kick drum <laughs> Don't ask me, man. but if i've, I've no got idea. a sample that i know works i'm just going to whack that in and build everything around that and then take it out and then match the kick drum to sound like that so at least it's in the ballpark of where i know i want it to be right I mean, I suppose that's just how my brain works. I like to work backwards instead of forwards. <laughs> hey, whatever works, man. <laughs> yeah, so I, I tend to like, like, so like with this plugin, again, it's like you're using a guitar tone that to me would be something that I probably wouldn't change a whole lot for a, an end production. And I feel like if you're being creative and you're working in the moment, you want something that that inspires you to get it lay it down and then when you hear it back in playback you're like fuck and you can really vibe on like what's happening and then you can also hear what it needs as well like with um say like oh it needs this overdub here because it really bring out this riff and stuff i feel like if you're working with like raw guitar tones the whole time you, you don't get that necessarily right depends absolutely. on the engineer maybe i've just 
you know, if you work with like one of these top engineers and they just know how to mic a cab and the guitar sounds awesome <laughs> and, and, and you're like, yeah, maybe I've just been in situations where that hasn't happened. Right. Maybe you just had some bad luck. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. But I guess you're a product of your own experience. So I guess that's why everybody's different with their right, approach true. to stuff. But that's how we developed this anyway. It was like, well, look, this is this is how I work. This is the kind of sound that I like. And, and this is kind of what I want to be hearing back when I'm working on stuff. And hopefully if I get inspired by by that, then it will translate into what other people like as well. Right. So, but I think it has. Like, I mean, I've had nothing but great feedback from, from people, even – you know, real like top professional mixers that have gone through the plug-in and they've just come back and gone, actually, this is really fucking good. Like, hell yeah. So, um, so I was, I wanted to ask like, just going forward, you know, end of 2019 going into 2020 and beyond one, how are you going to use your, your plugin for your own personal creativity and what is on the horizon all you know all plug-in Kemper aside whatever just you in general what's on the horizon just like what are your plans for the rest of this year and then going forward uh well rest of this year i'm gonna move out so that's gonna take care of a lot of non-musical time right because uh, we've got some renovations to do and, and all that kind of because i'm like building a, a, a studio in my garden so that's going to be interesting oh very cool well because i haven't really had a space like that before but but, you know, we've had the opportunity to find somewhere that's got a bit of space to, to be able to do that. So I'm like, right, this is it now. I'm, I'm approaching 40. I need my own man cave studio. Because <laughs> yeah. up to this point, I've just been working on laptops and uh, on tops of like laundry baskets <laughs> and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, you know, it, it's kind of nice because, you, you know, I suppose when you work like that for like so long, you really do appreciate the opportunity to like get in your own space and be like, oh, you know, I've kind of worked up to this point yeah you, you've, you've earned this gone in it. yeah exactly yeah. um because even now like i mean I, i've got a slightly better like desk and room and stuff that i've worked in um but sometimes i, I just end up fucking all that off and opening up the laptop and sitting on my kitchen table and just laying down <laughs> riffs and ideas and stuff in headphones right right that's another thing i've never got my head around is monitors i can't do it i don't know how people mix on monitors it's weird oh wow yeah, yeah I just, that's an I think maybe taste. it's because yeah I, I, I honestly I, I you know I, I people that mix will probably listen to this and go yeah well that's because your room ain't treated and it's not done properly and right. so yeah I know I, I know why it's just like you know things don't translate because you listen to on flat response monitors and stuff like that but again I don't listen to music on flat response monitors so how the fucking hell do you know how much <laughs> low end you want if you're not on a hype system that you know already do you know what I mean yeah absolutely because with a flat set of monitors you like oh bass is good there and then you go to like you know beats by Dre and all of a sudden you're blowing like your low ends at way oh, out of control <laughs> I can't believe you just brought them up they're horrible <laughs> I mean yeah I wouldn't I, there's no way I'd mix on anything like that no no I'm just saying I'm just saying like like somebody jam into what you created on flat set it, flat response headphones and then like it sounds good on that but then like you were saying you get something with a little more bass and then the bass is way out of control but you never heard well, you it to I, begin with you know what i've started doing now which is actually you know because you, you people like do the car test don't they like yeah, literally yeah, everybody yeah. that mixes they all do the car test it doesn't matter who you are cla's probably done the car test right um Oh, fuck, I'll just mix in my car. I've just started doing that. I <laughs> literally, that's why I started working on a laptop. I was just like, do you know what? I'm going to cut out the middleman here. I'm going to go out there and I'll tell you what, the low end is fucking perfect every time. No shit. And even the separation, it's weird because obviously when you've got that much low end going on, you can start to hear where everything else like sits. And weirdly enough, I listen to it on everything else and I'm like, I mean, I'll just contradict myself again because that isn't headphones either. But that's a... Uh, but that's an environment that those I'm are your, in those quite are your, a lot. Those are your monitors. <laughs> yeah, it's an environment I'm in quite a lot. Right. And, I, and I hear a lot of stuff through there because I sort of drive a lot and stuff. So I'm like, I, I know it in, inside out. Um, and then when you get on headphones just to check certain things that I'm used to hearing as well. Um, but like I'll track on headphones and, and, uh, and do all of that. So, you know, I can still hear it as... Because what I'll do is I'll go in there, I'll mix something, and then I'll go back to my headphones and be like, oh, okay, it's meant to sound like that. It's fine. Um, but I have recently just got a pair of um, Audio Technica uh, M50Xs. Oh, very cool, very cool. Ridiculous. Yeah. Best headphones I've used. Yeah. I, I've, I got them like two weeks ago, and I'm just like, oh, okay, 
this is this is what I've been mix, uh, missing with a pair of headphones. Right. You can actually hear where the kick's supposed to be. And then, so I'm I'm actually probably going to be doing less of my car stuff because I can hear everything I want in in them. But it's taken me a while though because I've had some Sennheiser HD 650s because they're open back. You lose all the low end out of them, so they're great for tracking. But I I don't know how anyone like mixes on them. Mind you, Nolly does all right. He's mixed tons of records on them yeah so I, I, um, I think it's just like it's just like an acquired like i said acquired taste and then like you know you know what what what's supposed to sound like what through your through your rig through your setup whatever yeah so i don't know but i've been through like tons of different headphones i had some bio dynamics i mean they need juicing up as well so i didn't have the proper power to run them so i was kind of fighting losing battle anyway right um earbuds i mean I, i've had some fairly successful mixes just doing using Apple earbuds to be honest with you so again that's that mix with like the car test and stuff yeah. it's like <laughs> but yeah I don't know you know it's whatever works in it I mean I, I'm I'm not that confident with like mixing anyway so maybe I'm just doing this these ridiculous routines that like a, a seasoned professional I'll just be like well I could have done that in an hour do you know what I mean I don't know what the fuck you're doing right who knows man but yeah, I suppose when you don't really know what you're after until you hear it, you just end up throwing as many balls at a coconut until it falls off. <laughs> right, exactly. But yeah. hey, I mean, you know, it, it it seems to be to be working though. You know what I mean? Like, whatever works for you. Yeah, I, that's how I approach guitar playing as well. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing with that either. I just sort of do it until it sounds all right, and it takes me ages. Hell yeah. <laughs> So uh, you got any, you got anything coming up like uh, 2020? Any sort of releasing or do, anything? Yeah, but I, it's um, kind of not anything I can talk about at the moment because uh, it's uh, not it's not been uh, a, an official thing. But um, yeah, is, is it, would uh, it be potentially be announced in say like January time? I think so. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. definitely coming up. But again, I don't really want to <laughs> say too much about that because you know that'll be kind of wanting it to be a thing and then you're like oh yeah, yeah. no it didn't happen but right. no I'm, I'm pretty pretty sure it's all cool it's just i don't want to say anything and then cool man I, it doesn't happen you yeah know? just fall through last minute fuck but yeah like if it if it does kind of go the way i think it's going and everything then yeah it's gonna it's gonna mean a, a pretty busy period for me like moving forward and something completely different that i ain't really done before so i'm kind of looking forward to it Oh yeah, and then you got the uh, you got Re- the Revenant being shipped out. I think in two weeks' time. All the pre-orders. Right. So the pre-orders are we've sold out, and then they're yeah. they're shipping out. I think like November on or around November twenty second or something like that. If my memory right. correct. Yeah. So that that that'll be huge for you, man. I mean, everybody's yeah. I mean, everybody's I'm, Jones I'm, to get them. I was uh, I was blown up, blown away by that pedal. I mean, because I'd had the plug-in version, and because yeah, we talked about doing something that was going to be unique for this release that hadn't been done on any of the other 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 releases and stuff like that and plus the fact i'd never done a signature overdrive pedal and i suppose being a guitar player it's the sort of thing that you would stick your name on i suppose yeah absolutely. um yeah so i just when when i uh actually got to try it in because I, I hadn't tried the pedal until we got to nashville and we were doing doing stuff um in the studio you know what i mean but like obviously i used the software version and I was really keen to see how the pedal version had come out. And it just like, I mean, actually, the reaction is on the video. It's not fake. That was literally the first time I plugged into it. And yeah, I was yeah, kind reaction. of talking about it and blown away by it all at the same time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, that, I mean, everybody's everybody's super hyped, hitting up, uh, you know, all the social media on STL Tones. Like, you know, when's the second batch coming around? We're, you know, we sold out and you know shorter period of time when can i when can i buy this again so it's like yeah. everybody everybody's eager to get it man and you and, you and yeah. me both i'm 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 pumped <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's definitely cool it's a kind of cool new development within the sort of signature stuff with my name on definitely so. absolutely yeah i mean it's, it's just like that next like uh notch on your belt you know what i mean like having signature gear is always cool you know what i mean like so it's something something to be proud of for sure you know what i mean yeah, yeah, and also, you know, it's something that isn't just like a gimmick either. You know what I mean? It's like something that I'll actually use. And, right, absolutely. You know, same same with the guitars and picks and all the rest of it. You know, like I, I never, I never do anything like that unless it's hundred percent like what I'm using because I just feel like otherwise you're just bullshitting people. You know, going, oh yeah, this is great, and and you don't actually use it. You know, everything that I've said that, that I've kind of used and got behind and 
it is it's stuff that I've used or will use or you know whatever do you know what I mean because I, I believe in it because I wouldn't sit there and go oh yeah this is great and then you just be honest you just think it's a piece of shit you know? yeah it's just like a quick quick cash grab and then you know it, it's 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 over in like a month and nobody will care because you know truth always comes out like if it, if it's if a product sucks people are gonna find out really fast well i mean yeah we really had to like believe it. i mean i i i wholeheartedly believe like in this plugin and oh and absolutely and, and everything it's like i mean even around the time of the release it was like because you know we went up against another competitor yeah. um competitor and it was just like you know obviously with with knowledge reputation and everything and we're like you know this is gonna be killer whatever it is and it's just like you know what this what we've done is killer you know we're, we're just like so into this you know we believe in it and it doesn't really matter you know what i mean it's like look people are going to discover if it's good or not right no matter absolutely. when it comes out so it's just like yeah fuck it absolutely yeah, it. it was it was it was uh I have to use use the right word it was challenging that that initial release but like you know we had discussions you know behind the scenes and basically the, the theme was like you know it's at the end of the day it's like it's a good time to be a, a creator and a product creator yeah sure you're going up against competition but that makes your company better makes their company better and you know in a year from now nobody's going to remember when those came out it's just no they're going to care if it's good or not at that point in time you know what i mean like nobody's going to care like oh man they came both came out august 30th or whatever it was like it's not yeah. gonna matter no and that's the thing you know you just got to just you know believe in what you do because it's the same with like albums and like you know major major bands come out with albums on the same day it's like oh well we can't put that album out now because such and such put their album out it's like well it doesn't really matter does it i mean if the music's good then yeah <laughs> you can release it six months from now and if it's shit it's still going to be shit then right. so do you know what i mean yeah make a better album than the person that's releasing it the same day and you won't have to worry about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so you know i'm uh I'm well happy with how it came out. Honestly, I just, I, I, I mean, even now, like I plug into it, I'm just blown away by how good it feels and sounds. You know, it's just, it's just the sort of thing where I'm just like, I actually couldn't, if I wanted to, sit down and, for my own personal taste, make it any better than the way it turned out. Right. And yeah. I suppose that's how you want to be. Really, you don't want to have done all that work on something and then you plug into it and you're just like, oh, what if we'd have done this? You know. Yeah, cause then it's like it's you, it's all it's almost all for nothing. Yeah, it's out. It's cool. It's got your name on it. But you know, if if you have that what if factor, then it's like it's always going to eat at you forever. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. But then I suppose it's an opportunity to do version two. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> no, but <laughs> maybe we shot ourselves in the foot from yeah, the right. marketing point of view. <laughs> we just did it too good the first time yeah. around. It's like, oh, now where can we go? You know? Yeah, you can't make two point and make just ah, oh, we made it better. But it's the exact yeah. same thing. I don't know. But um, hey man. So if there's anything else you know you want to say to anybody that's a, a fan of yours, anything you got coming up, you know, the floor's yours. And uh, you know, I just want to say beforehand, just thank you for for the time and the opportunity, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Cheers, man. Um, well, yeah, not not really anything that I can kind of talk about, but um, you can follow me on Instagram, uh, Facebook, YouTube. Um, and then, yeah, you'll be up to date with all the updates as they get updated. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Well, hey, one, one more time. Thank you so much for, for joining me, man. I, 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 had a, I had a lot of fun talking to you and I hope you did as well. And, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I'd, I'd be more than honored to have you back on talking with me and, and getting back on the podcast, man. Yeah, cool, man. All right. Well, thanks for having me and take care, mate. I'll all speak right. To you later. Talk to you later, Andy. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye.